you hear me? Hello, yes. everybody. My name is Kenisha Kartit. I am the chair of the Masters of Digital Innovation in FinTech. I started this role in July. It was a surprise, actually, so I'm going to tell the personal story a little bit and don't try to go fast. Five minutes that I have, I'll try to respect it. Uh, I have been um, adjunct faculty with uh, Brandeis since 2008. How did I get there? I, I'm my previous life. <laughs> uh, my, I, I have an MBA and a master's in finance, and they did the CFA track. And I was an expat in Saudi Arabia with my husband, but then I continued CFA, and they did investment banking, and I was nominated the first c female CEO investment in, in an investment bank in Riyadh, in the history of that country, you know, women's history. So I like to say the first. I was also the first field oil manager in Shell Oil in Morocco, and I was promoted many times in three years to become in Tunisia, Egypt, and then I did special projects with the UK and Holland. So I'm a fast best base lady. So <laughs> that's how, but it was proven over and over. I love that. That's, that gives me energy. And I like to share whatever I do with my students. That's my way. In fact, it's a virtuous cycle. When I give, I get, you know? So I, I just find this. Uh, when I joined Brandeis, it was the first role as educator. And I enjoyed it so much. And then I started also teaching women entrepreneurship at Cornell University. And uh, it's been four years that I teach launching fintech startups at Brandeis. And it's a um, small group. So I will talk about the structure of the program right now, uh, later. But what I liked is like I know every student of mine. Even if it's online, I know them. I know their life. I know what they want. I know the project. And then I worked with them as an advisor, not as a a teacher because I I'm not an educator I just came from advisory role and that's what I continue to do with my students so my uh, like uh, passion right now is thinking about the future of skills future of youth future of generations future of society future of technology future of women in societies, that's what I think about day and night. That's my, <laughs> it's always future, you know? So, um, and it's all fuse. It's all fused together, like uh, the talent, the workforce, and I always try to find a bridge between the skills and the, the work. You know, so because I'm still, I'm uh, my day. My day is practice, and my night is teaching. So it's uh, always I was telling, um, uh, I was telling the director of the program that what one fun thing about this is I teach and I see the output, the fruit of the teaching right there. In and um, I want to um, I want to say the structure of the program first. So that's um, part time, hundred percent. So for the people who want flexibility, it's for professionals. Uh, the t students that I taught are coming are senior. Uh, people in banking, but they needed to upgrade and update themselves to go into fintech because, of course, finance is evolving to fintech and the opportunity lies there, so they have to follow. And um, oh, so it was a great bridge to take them there. Also, we have, we have even from the public sector, I closed a capstone project with a student who worked for the government. And what we did is that we fused again, community, government, public service, and FinTech. So we took, we, we say, we took some pages from FinTech and we implement them in an app uh, for uh, service uh, of uh, public agencies to the citizen, which was very interesting capstone project. Another capstone project that I closed is with a lady. She works in the Middle East. She's a CFA. She's, she's attorney. She was in our program. And uh, her product was digital identity. In fact, this week, all the topic, the first topic is digital identity. Okay? So that was three years back. And her project was implemented in the bank. From there, she took a C-level role with Temasek in Singapore, Sovereign Wealth Fund, because she's from there. And uh, But it just, there are endless opportunities when you know how to leverage what you have to make that what you have really practical immediately in something that comes next. So that's future of skills and how to upgrade and upskill, reskill, and prepare you know, talent for what's to come next. Um, I don't know if I said everything about the product, the program, but yeah, I think the main point that I wanted to drive here is the flexibility. 
the like senior roles can be reskilled and upskilled in our program. Uh, FinTech is not about money only. FinTech is like uh, is uh, transcends every. Uh, walk of life, like it touches democracy, it, it touches public service, it touches dignity. Anything about money, digital is like uh, to empowerment and to. So it's uh, it's not we we do not. I I don't think that our students should be only from financial services. I think our students just come from all industries because every industry needs fintech, needs technology, and needs um, movement of money. So. We are relevant in all industries, and uh, any any uh, candidate from our program can be uh, a big asset in an organization for technology and for management of money and uh, transactions and anything that has to do with value. Especially fintech now is touching too much into crypto and digital assets, and you see all the discussion that's happening about CBDC and all the regulation of digital, and that's at the heart, that fintech is at the heart of all that, because money is power and power touches everything in life. So I think I said it all. <laughs> Um, so, welcome. My name is Dabarshi Nandi, and I'm the Barbara and Rosenberg Professor of Global Finance at uh, the Brandeis International Business School. Uh, I'm also the program director of the Masters in Finance program, of which FinTech is one of the tracks. Um, so, uh, Khadija gave a wonderful introduction, and I think in, uh, in the spirit of that, um, one of the unique um, aspects of Brandeis is that it is truly a global um, university in almost all respects. And uh, that's where uh, our, um, um, you know, the, the fusion of liberal arts along with um, very high quant uh, technological skills kind of comes together. And uh, FinTech is a wonderful place where I think the two of them kind of melt and can do uh, great things for the future. Um, so let me, without further ado, uh, just get us started. Um, so we, our first panel today is on um, global uh, FinTech spotlight on uh, different companies and uh, other um, uh, players uh, in the FinTech ecosystem worldwide. Um, I would just like to thank um, our uh, sponsors, which is, uh, um, apart from the uh, Graduate Professional School at Brandeis University, it's the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance and the Perlmutter Institute uh, at uh, Brandeis University. Um, and uh, with that, uh, let me introduce our moderator for the session, my colleague, Professor Ahmad Namini. Uh, professor Namini is a professor of the practice of analytics at uh, the Brandeis International Business School. And um, he has a passion for everything in analytics and particularly for sports analytics. Uh, and uh, he teaches us very many wonderful classes uh, which uh, uh, spans all the way from finance to sports analytics. Uh, Professor Namini was the CTO prior to joining at Brandeis at uh, several fixed income and investment banking um, hedge funds as well as uh, um, uh, other banks um, across uh, the country. Prior to that, he was a professor of computer science at the University of Miami. So without further ado, Professor Namini. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we should ask our speakers to come in, if you don't mind, and we have a panel seat for you. I think that way we can all see everybody at the same time. First of all, I'm going to sit when I talk. I just, it's just, just a lot easier for me at my rather old age. I would also like to say this is the first time I've been in a conference with people since COVID uh, started. So I was wondering how come nobody brought their backgrounds with them as they're sitting here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a totally different world now. But it's so nice to get out and see people again. I'm so happy that everybody came here. The focus of this panel is on a global fintech spotlight. I will introduce our eminent speakers, have them talk about the companies and the goal here. What are they doing? How did they get here? What do they see the future? If we can go about 45 minutes with uh, formal questions, which I will hopefully be able to direct properly, 
then we'll get to a point where we will open it up to questions from everybody, okay? Um, also like to say, there's a lot of people that go into organizing these things and they will be acknowledged uh, a lot l later, but I just wanted to say thank you to all the staff here that actually help with that. Before I introduce all of the panel, I just would like to acknowledge the role played by Ambassador Marin Rubin, who is the Council General of Israel to New England, and also to Ellie Levin, who is the Innovation and Economic Attaché at the Consulate in fostering the collaboration between the Israeli and the Boston FinTech communities. One of our speakers today is Tal Sharon, who is right here, has connected with us through the efforts of the ambassador himself. So we just definitely like to thank them. And we're also uh, joined today by the Deputy Council of Israel for New England, Edith Yanis. And I hope I am pronouncing all of these names correctly. She's back there, thank you. I'd like to very quickly introduce each one of our panel speakers. I will introduce them, they'll say a few words, and then we can finally get started, okay? Uh, in no particular order, but I guess I should do it in the order that they speak, uh, that they sit closer to me. Amitav Sinha, to my right. What? Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Sasi Sista is the co-founder of Grad Right, where he contributes to the overall growth of the company with a special focus on student success in the product. He has over 10 years of experience in the global higher education sector as the founding director of outreach and admissions at Ashoka University. Uh, he played a decisive role in setting up and building up the brand as India's foremost private liberal arts institution. He's also worked with the research department of Insteed Business School at Singapore and helped develop a brand analytics product that was acquired recently by Kantar. So thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and sharing what we have in our minds with folks in Boston. I'm here for, uh, for about three days, and I'm very excited with what is happening in this event. So briefly, uh, what drove us to, to set up GradRide was a problem, a problem that we probably, all of us, thought about at least once in our lifetimes, which is which university to go and what to study either for yourselves or for your kids. And that's a problem that we thought uh, is extremely challenging for those who don't have all the tuition fee in their bank accounts. So we said, how do we enable the, uh, the students to, or, and the parents to actually choose better? And that is where it started. And we saw on one side, banks were only giving money to those who have the money already. Uh, but the education is the one which is a ladder to get out of middle class or lower middle class to a higher economic class. And that's why we set up a platform to solve that problem. And we happen to be a FinTech over time. Uh, so we are very excited to create a global platform uh, where uh, we have been uh, you know, connecting universities, banks, and students in one platform. It was one of its kind. And directly addressing the student loan uh, debt or the outstanding debt issue that we today know of in the US, for example. So we have wonderful investors, advisors, and students, universities from the US who are supporting the entire journey. But we operationalized ourselves in India, and we, uh, over the last 20 months of operations, we touched about a billion dollars of loan requests on the platform that shows the amount of demand it has uh, and the amount of work that we need to do. I'll pause here, and I'm happy to participate. Thank you very much. So. Um, I want to apologize again for choosing the wrong name, but our second panelist member here is Tal Sharon, who is a fintech consultant specializing in analyzing the requirements of corporates and financial institutions in their fintech transformation process. He has been leading dozens of engagements between the fintech companies and global financial institutions, consulting regulators and government bodies in the fintech transformation and market education, and supporting the growth of fintech companies. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. So um, great introduction. There's not much, much to say, but my role is very unique. I'm pretty passionate about fintech. I started in 2014, when fintech wasn't really a 
there wasn't a substance to it. People, it, like companies who didn't even know that they were fintech companies uh, at that time. Um, my job is particularly to engage between the Israeli market, which you probably, at least you heard about the tech scene in Israel. It's booming. It is one of the highest growing uh, tech scene globally. I, I love to say that we're second uh, in terms of market share in the New York Stock Exchange. So Israeli companies, where Israel has about 9 mil million people, has the second lar largest market share in the New York Stock Exchange after the US. So US, Israel, China. And that's just mind blowing. And FinTech is one of the four pillars that are very um, active uh, in Israel. We had $4.4 .4 billion invested in FinTech uh, only last year. Um, and a lot of multinationals are making their way. So it is a very unique ecosystem. And what I do a part of connecting the FinTech uh, fintechs from Israel from to multinationals is working with different ecosystems around the world on how can they create a, a lucrative fintech environment. So, for example, in Madrid post-COVID, how can we engage and get uh, the SMEs uh, some more financing through tech? In uh, Lithuania, how can we build a better ecosystem for fintech to evolve? And this is, uh, there are seven elements that uh, we can talk about that are really creating and constructing this fintech ecosystem. Um, but for me, um, I, think, I think anyone here should visit Israel. Have any of you visited Israel? One, two, okay. You read probably also. So um, you should definitely come. And if you do, please let me know. We're hosting a lot of delegations, so I'll show you around. Uh, all the banks and, and fintech in, in Israel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our uh, third panel member here is Amitab Sinha, who is the COO of Pentation Analytics, currently spearheading the international business for Pentation Analytics in the United States. He's worked for 24 years with Fortune 500 companies in North America, Europe, and Singapore, mainly in the areas of big data, enterprise technology, and the digital transformation, among others. Thank you. Um, so very interestingly, I represent a company uh, called Pentition Analytics, which is headquartered in India. And we are a fintech company, but what we do is slightly different than possibly the others who do, for example, on the analytics side. So we have a platform, and we work with you know, financial startups in India. Uh, they can vary across different specific domains, like they can be on the we we have something called um, you know like uh, non banking financial services in india which is very popular they are into like small loans etc so we work with them uh, we work with uh, insurance companies especially on the you know personal lines and sometimes the big ones like marines etc now very interestingly what we do here is so if you look at it uh, the whole analytics piece has traversed quite a lot so we we have three classifications of analytics Descriptive analytics, which is pure play reporting and dashboards, right? So that's where it, the entire analytics started, right? And then the financial industry did catch up, but they were very good in descriptive analytics. Our reports are fully automated, beautiful looking dashboards, graphs, trends, great. The next uh, segment of analytics, which was uh, predictive analytics. So for example, how is the market going to behave? Stock market, right? How is the, like the foreign exchange going to fluctuate, so on and so forth. So that's predictive was also there. So people thought that descriptive analytics and predictive analytics were good for the businesses and enough. But what they did not realize is the data that they, their transaction data or the data that's available in the market has the capability to generate a lot of insights. And if those insights are really taken into consideration, they can actually open up great dimensions for the, for the businesses that they're in. So we have a platform and we focus specifically on what we say as prescriptive analytics, which is all about generating insights on the line of business they're in. Given an opportunity when I discuss, I'll talk about very interesting use cases that we have done with insurance companies on you know, catastrophe managements. We have done uh, very interesting prescriptive analytics or insights on for example, what kind of, let's say, for an IBFC, non-banking financial corporation, you do not have so much of 
to give out loans too. So you especially work on smaller kitty loans, right? And and you try and do it in a very fast-paced churn rate, which means let's say you give out the loan today, and then you expect the loan to be repaid back in about a week's time, because and then the capital is low, but the interest. As it's, you don't really have a collateral back in India. I'll explain the case when I talk about it. Very interestingly, so we have been able to create, so for example, if you've heard of the name Bandhan Bank, so one of our first customers, and they're like a full-fledged bank, but they started off NBFC, and they use a lot of our prescriptive analytics to create the kind of you know, business they are in now. So we'll talk about a few use cases. So that's me. Uh, I don't have a finance bank. Physics and computer science from India, IIT, so I got that. So, and then, of course, I did my master's in the US. We were just across the street. We didn't bump into each other, Pittsburgh. So I'm from Carnegie Mellon, <laughs> that way. And then uh, I started off my career with IBM Watson. I have five patents with IBM on the big data analytics. So I'm trying to use that whole concept now and trying to make some sense in the fintech industry. Thank you, Randwise, for bringing me here. With you guys, thank you. Thank you, Amitav. Um, our fourth speaker, definitely not the last, will be Micah Sabovic, uh, CEO of MentorWorks, and she has more than 25 years of experience in the higher education and higher ed adjunct, I mean, adjacent space, focusing on operations, job search, and career advancement, financial aid, admissions, enrollment, sales, and marketing. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Um, MentorWorks is a workforce development entity, and we use fintech uh, principles to be able to deliver what we need to our students. So we're looking to solve the debt crisis, student loan debt crisis, and part of that is creating pathways for our students to be able to afford to go to school, and then working with them uh, to actually find employers that want to hire them. So solving two different pieces, and we're doing that with a lot of, um, you know, we're working, with a, we're working with a bank. We have platforms where we're originating our income share agreements. Uh, we have uh, platforms where we're working with uh, employers on uh, getting our students hired. So we're trying to use um, technology to advance uh, folks forward in their in their careers, in their lives, and not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. So really setting them up for success. Uh, you know, I've been at MentorWorks for a little little over three years now. We still are a startup. Uh, we're based in, in Boston, even though a lot of our, our team is remote. Uh, we are in the in the Boston area, and you know, really just looking forward to uh, speaking with you all today and learning more from the rest of the panel as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so since this is all about uh, global fintech, I just want to just set some perspective is that five years ago, we would have thought of fintech as something else. It's constantly forming, morphing into something new. Definitely a lot more complicated, a lot more technology focused. And again, with COVID, we definitely learned that if you dream something, it may actually come true. I mean, we've changed the way that we're working and so forth. So I'd like to ask the panel members, and you can answer at will if you like or not, you know, what are the challenges that you went through recently, and where do you think that the global fintech is actually going to go next? And I know it's a very generic question, very high level, but that's fine if you don't mind. And if you pass around the actual microphone, that would be good. Oh. Of course. All right, perfect. No, I'm, I'm totally ready for this. So um, a lot of what we do is working with different financial institutions around the world. So I know and see a lot of trends that are in different markets. And what I like to see is how these trends, trends are kind of interlinked. And one of the major things that is uh, happening, happening right now is the transition from retail to corporate. So probably you notice that a lot of the fintechs are focusing on B2C or focusing on the retail, not, even if they're not B2C client um, uh, focused, they, they focus on the retail clients. And the corporate clients are being a bit neglected in the past several years. And I see a lot of challenges in financial institutions saying, listen, we are getting a lot of feedback I'm, I'm, as a user Let's say I'm the I'm the um, CFO in a in a company, right? 
as a personal user, I use fintech all the time. But when I go to work, right, and I need to sign something, I still need to go to the bank because there's no uh, process uh, process for it. Like the lack of technology for the corporate side is something that is is staggering. So. I see more and more fintechs looking into, okay, what can we solve? And there's a huge opportunity there because it might be less in terms of the amount of companies you have or amount of clients you have, but the volume is, is outstanding and the need is phenomenal. So you can involve payment and, and financing and, and debt and credit, uh, uh, insurance, all of them into one. So corporate banking is... Definitely a trend that I, I think we'll see uh, growing further um, in the next couple of years. Yeah, Tal, I just want to a question to you on this whole concept of decentralized finance. Do you see a lot of that that's going to change from just a few large banks to everybody doing everything? And wow, this is this is complicated because on one hand you have open banking and the ability for non-financial institutions or non non-financial services companies to provide financial services. So in Israel, just just yesterday, they announced that the, um, you can get a license as a non-payment institution to provide payment, which means that every company can become a fintech company. If you have the data, if you have the, the resources, if and if you have the trust of your, your clients, you can embed and, and transact and add financial services to them. So the competition, the, lens, the competition landscape is completely changing. And there's like uh, different waves. So the first wave, the banks were, okay, we're, we're, here to, we're dominating. And there are several fintechs that are trying to nibble in our market share. Fast forward, fintechs are working with financial institutions, but they're both in the same, let's say, playground. But now we have third parties that are non-financial at all. We, you know, we saw it with GAFA, all the large um, Google, Facebook, Amazon who provide the full range of, of financial services. But you have smaller companies who are starting to, to take that, you know, take that uh, percentage and already have the client. Why not providing them right. with financing or, or loans or, or uh, insurance? Thank you. Um, anybody else would like to contribute with regards to the trends they see? Yeah. Uh, what I would like to add is... Um, See, the ability to make course corrections is very important in today's fintech world. Any of the established businesses, big or small, cannot have a very focused line of operations and can or would need to stick to that and just let it see what happens. I'll give an example. So, for example, uh, see when COVID happened, right? Uh, so, so this money collection that happens in you know typically. For the SME loans, the small merchant establishment loans, so you have feet on street people who's to go and collect money from these people, right? Uh, daily collection, weekly collections, etc. And it's a little unstructured, but the money rolls very fast and it works well. Now, when COVID really stuck, right? So these small merchants and establishments, they were obviously they were shut, and there were no people on feet on the street to go and really collect money. So which means so if you are a lending house, so your asset was actually becoming an NPA, non-performing asset, because you're unable to re realize and recollect the money. So how do you work on those lines, right? So, so there were companies who really thought, you know, uh, did some very good innovations on that. So what did they do was, for example, these kind of small loans do not really have collaterals, right, to support that you're, it's still not an NPA. So interestingly, what they did was they they thought out of their feet and actually created an enabling platform so that these SMEs could still get some business and work together and collaborate together. You get my point, what I'm trying to say. So, uh, so these lending houses, they came together and said, see, our main business comes from the people who borrow. And they're unable to pay money because they are, they are gone out of business because of COVID. Shall we create an ecosystem where they can still do some business, they can still do some transaction? It was very simple. They created an e-commerce platform where they could exchange goods among themselves and use the ecosystem like Uber Eats or something like that to get those deliveries to the customer. See, customers still needed to eat food, right, to order food, but the entire ecosystem was not there. 
So they created this ecosystem, and this is thinking out of the field. Because for a, for a lending house, this was not their main course of business. So they could have sat tight and waited for COVID to get over and get the money back or declare an NPA, or they could facilitate that. So that was one use case I was talking about, right? Thinking out of the fit. And then, as I said, course corrections. So I was talking about Bandhan Bank. So Bandhan Bank started off as an NBFC. And uh, so if you look at the Indian ecosystem, right? So there are very large banks like State Bank of India, then HDFC, ICICI. They're like global players, right? So SBI is like, you know, almost has a, holds about 30% of the capex is of the entire India. So that's the kind of bank they are in. Now, so those kind of banks, as you, as, you know, they were explaining, that it's very difficult to get loans. And that is why you have those, you know, the new age fintech hubs are getting created to facilitate the educational loans because it is quicker. They understand the problem statement, right? The bigger banks did not. Now, so what happens in India, if you really look at it, so let's say this, there is a big festival coming in next one week, which is called Durga Puja, which is quite big in the eastern part of India. And so it's like a five-day, six-day festival where people will go around with families, eat a lot of food. So we'll find a lot of people setting up, you know, shops on the roadside and trying to sell stuff, right? So they would cook home from, they would cook at home and then go and sell it. But in order to do that, they need some capital infusion, right, to go and buy the raw material, correct? Where will they get that? They don't have it. So Bandhan Bank thought, again, as I said, out of their feet, right, on their feet, out of the box, and they created these small loans that, okay, we know that you are going to set up a stall and you need a capital infusion, small, very small, probably about $500, right, in terms of U.S. currency. But that was enough for them to infuse that capital, and they would, you know, use that capital to make those foods or, you know, buy some toys and sell it on the road, and then would recover that money in three days or four days very fast, right? And this became so successful as, as a business model. They went from, you know, from for, for example, from the street vendors, they started doing it with the vegetable mongers, fish mongers, right? Because they also need... And they also need capital to go and buy fish from the, I would say, the wholesale market and come and sell in the retail market. So there it is much more interesting because the money spins in a day. So typically, let's say weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, that's where most of the Indians do huge uh, you know, groceries and all that stuff. So these fish mongers or vegetable mongers would take a small loan, another like $500 to $1,000 on a Friday night, go to the wholesale market, buy it, and then sell the products, and the entire money is paid back by Sunday evening with a 20%, 30% interest in just two days. That's thinking out of the field. And so if you're in a, you know, this, this today's fintech, you cannot have a very, you, 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 you need to have your vision, etc. but you should also have the ability to make course corrections. Very important. Awesome. Anybody else want to contribute? Okay. Yeah, I think one of the challenges uh, that a lot of fintechs have is they're using cutting edge technology. They're building all of these cool products, but they're interacting, to follow up on Tal's point, they're interacting with other organizations that maybe aren't so hip. Uh, so, you know, you have to build all these different pieces and then you're reporting to other entities or regulators and maybe they're looking at it from the old school per perspective. So I think that kind of piece, those kind of pieces slow you down a little bit because you're always, you know, making little adjustments to make sure that you're answering the questions from the other uh, entities that you're working with. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one situation where you would see, um, you know, maybe a, a little bit slower product rollout because you have to also send a CSV file to a bank um, in some sort of encrypted fashion. Uh, being a CEO of a startup is like playing whack-a-mole. Uh, so, you know, there's usually like some little thing that's happening all the time, uh, but I would say that's probably a, a very fintech specific problem is that you're trying to build and create, but you're also kind of stuck in the past a little bit too and, and making sure that you're answering all the questions that need to be answered. Thank you, Micah. Um, I was going to also ask, and she she made a great point, was the whole concept of regulation, because these are global firms we're talking about, that they could be very local. So I was wondering, and we'll start with Sassy here, if like 
you've encountered any of that old thinking, which like you coined the, the actual term, because I see it all the time too. Like how do you deal with the fact that you can run, but everybody still just wants you to walk? Probably because you're next to me, you already read my mind. Uh, so uh, in fact, this is a very painful one. In fact, what I was uh, tr thinking about the last two years was uh, right when the COVID hit, uh, you know, in, in general, education loans or student loans in India, how they work is you have to visit a branch. You have to go to the, uh, you know, uh, to the to the bank and sit with them and explain the, you know, what, what you're trying to study and fill in an application and do that manually with each bank. There is no, uh, you know, uh, online application and approval and 15 second approval, nothing of that sort. Uh, so it, it, it was very interesting that when the entire lockdown, uh, you know, happened, the first thing the students were stuck with the admits is that they can't get the money because the banks are shut. So we we it, it took it took three weeks for us to launch uh, an online platform to to set it up. If we can, if and from that point of we have been asking some of the largest banks like ICICI Bank and you know whatnot, they the amount of time they take to move is you know, twelve months versus three weeks. So uh, the agility is a is a huge uh, plus for any fintech. Uh, in general to, to act on that problem and try to build business models around that. Uh, connected point is regulation in terms of how we, we have seen in the last two years, uh, there is a lot of uh, flux around regulation. It's not very clear on uh, is, it, is government supporting fintechs or is it uh, not supporting fintechs. So there, is, uh, there are signals which are mixed, uh, a, a, but overall, 2021 in India, we saw about 21 unicorns and a lot of funding came in. Uh, of course, about 10% of what U.S. gathered, but still it's a sizable chunk. Uh, so while regulation was confusing and, and it definitely pulled us back because, for example, when we saw that, on an average, 60% of students are getting rejected even though they have good choices made. In their, in their programs, they're going to good programs, they're going to earn more over time, but there is no availability of, of loans. So the banks are like, my credit policy doesn't say that I should give the loan. And we're like, this guy is, needs to go right now, so you need the money to be put in. So they would ask us, you know, uh, you know, why don't you provide a collateral or security? And we will extend the credit line. Now, as a fintech, we can put that, but is that a viable business model? The regulation talks about the first loss default guarantee model, which is always the Reserve Bank of India says that, oh, we don't support it, we support it, and it's mixed. So can we build a business model around it? Yes or no, we still don't know. So we, we have to figure out as we go and we have to be ready to change ways. So that's extremely challenging, uh, you know, for the nimble, uh, for the small team that a FinTech usually is and the aggressive pace at which we want to go. These, uh, uh, the, the amount of, uh, confusions the regulations create often slows us down. So we, we heard a lot about student loans, about SME financing, and I want to talk about what I see as, as the next life of, of um, the next revision in, in products in fintech. So for example, in right, uh, student loans, um, there's a, a whole theme now that bundling, taking several student loans together, bundling it together, right? And building a new product out of it. So you eliminate some of the risk or at least try to mitigate it as you have a portfolio of, of, uh, of, um, um, of different uh, uh, students and combining it with the way to assess how, uh, if the student is credit worthy because the assessment ways right now are completely different and, and evolving because we use social media, we use uh, analytics, a lot of things that we haven't been able to attract before um, to provide us more insight on whether this person will be, uh, will be able to, to pay his, his, his or hers, sorry, um, uh, loans. Um, and similar to that in small and medium businesses and like small and medium businesses are actually the, this is the engine of almost any ecosystem, any market. 
And nevertheless, the banks aren't really excited to provide financing for them, right? They're only about 20% of small and medium businesses are actually getting finance from the bank. So they need external resources, and which cost them a lot of money. And that's where fintech comes into play, where companies are saying, okay, we'll give you the financing. And on top of that, you can create a new uh, type of, uh, um, of product, again, taking several small uh, small medium businesses, aligning them together into one product that for the bank will make much more sense. Because why would they give a $100,000 loan where they can give a $2 million loan? The onboarding process is the same. The risk appetite, you know, the, the sorry, the risk averse is, is makes more sense for them to, to provide to, to the more sustainable companies. Um, so if, if all we need to do is think outside the box and try to see where are the challenges right now, how do we solve them? And with some creative thinking and combining different uh, um, uh, realms in fintech or different categories into one, you can create great things and really um, empower business going forward. So point of view. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, we were talking about technology and something came up earlier with regards to self-identification. I think that was from Khadija. She was talking about that. I'm curious about technology. I mean, things are on the forefront, like quantum computing is going to be the next big thing. So I was going to ask, uh, hopefully, Amitabh, if you, if you don't mind. I mean, there's a lot of the technologies out there that are going to drastically change the way that business is done. Do you see something at the forefront, something that may affect what your company is doing? Oh, yes. Um, a very valid thing. See, uh, so especially with fintech, you work with a lot of personal information, right? PII, so personally identifiable information. And, for example, trying to use the social media or the transaction behavior to understand whether this particular person will have has the ability to pay or has the desire to pay, right? So those things will involve a lot of personally identifiable information. And we have a restriction because of GDPR in Europe. You can't work with those, right? Then, uh, for example, there are restrictions like if the transactions data, if there are financial transactions data, that needs to be kept within the specific geography. You cannot have it hosted or it cannot leave that particular geography. These problems are all there, right? Now, the good part is uh, the cybersecurity laws are quite strong, right? The anti-money laundering policies are quite strong. Because when you talk about fintech, the AML piece, the anti-money laundering piece comes absolutely hand-to-hand, -hand, right? And um, so I'll give you a very small example. Uh, I, so I spend a lot of time in the developing countries, right? So if you look at Bangladesh, right? You'll be amazed that Bangladesh says, uh, you know, their uh, GDP is actually becoming better than India because they're doing very well. At the same time, you'll be surprised, they have about 120 odd banks in Bangladesh, right? It's a country. Out of which, the 20 are top performers and they are very well. The rest of the 100 odd banks, they keep merging, demerging, declassified every time. Every three months they march, and every another three months they demerge, and then create another coalition. So there is a lot of anti-money laundering that goes on, and typically people who but there was there was a point when people stopped doing international business with Bangladesh just because of this because there's a lot of anti-money laundering that was happening. So how do you handle all this? The good part is the financial. In order to support the fintech, because we want the fintech to grow, so technology companies like us. So we are, so quantum computing is one which allows you to basically analyze a lot of transactions, billions and billions of transactions, billions of, uh, you know, across different geographies to be monitored at a very short amount of time, real time. So that's one part which is coming up very well. Cybersecurity uh, st uh, laws are getting stronger and we are implementing them very strongly using technology. So there are encryption standards which are coming up, like AES-256 encryption standards, which we follow, for example, as part of our platform, right? So which means the data at rest, as well as the data at motion when the data is being transferred, they're absolutely encrypted. So even if you have somebody doing a siphoning or doing a, like a, you know, like a, trying to snip the data, they would actually get a garbled data. They will not be able to make anything out of it. 
So far as PII, PII is very interesting case and it has, I'll be honest, we are still solving it as an industry. Why? Because you need the data in order to make those analytics, right? But then, and then how do you have the data? Because if you are mass, let's say, you know, you can't really go and play around with your SSN. Generally what happens is you only share the four, last four digits of your SSN, right? You don't share the, the beginning six of them, right? So, so that's what I'm trying to say. So we, so, so there are, so if you do too much of, you know, protection, then the data is not available for you to make analytics or insights, right? So we are talking about something like a digital locker. So we are implementing that in our platform. We are working with a lot of startups in the US and also back in India where we are saying that, hey, startups, you don't worry about all this GDPR regulations, PII, encryption of the data, et cetera. You concentrate your business, we'll be happy to facilitate and give, you a, give our platform so that the, you know, it's like a Hertzberg two-factor principle. This is like sanitation. Nobody questions it. So you think about the acclimatization factor. We'll take care of the sanitation piece. The digital locker uh, is getting centrally, you know, uh, introduced. For example, in in the U.S., Pentation is uh, like Pentation is working very. My company is working very closely with uh, US, USCIS. So USCIS is planning to create that digital locker, which means, so it's like one body, government body, for a particular country will have all this information personally. Not every company will have it. Other companies will actually be used a token for validation, which means your data is safe with one organization, right? It doesn't go along. So those things are coming up. But then the tried, the, but what we are doing from the technology industry is we don't want to create or use this as impediments for the business. So we want to take care of the impediments. We want the businesses to prosper. Because if you prosper, we'll also prosper. Simple. Micah, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask something about staffing. Because that's weird. Because the like skill sets that people need nowadays, whether they're students or they're pro professionals, it's constantly changing. So I'm curious if you could add any light from your experience. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I think the, the most... Um, the best attribute a person can have going into a startup is a mentality of flexibility, right? You have to be adaptable. A lot of startups, especially as they're they're really getting going, uh, you know, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats. And uh, our CEO is here today, so he can tell you that you have to have the ability to multitask uh, if you want to be able to be successful in a startup. And it does take um, it takes a unique perspective, a unique person, a unique skill set to be able to. Throw in that environment. Um, so, you know, if, if you're a, a student coming out, um, you know, taking on a bunch of different different roles, um, so you have uh, a way to enlarge your skill set. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to try out a lot of different things, too, so you can see what you're really interested in. So I think that adaptability and flexibility is, is probably the, the, biggest, the biggest key um, to make sure that, you know, you can thrive in a startup rather than crush under the weight of what could be happening or the, the looming dark around the corner. Thank you. Well, I'd like to, if people don't mind, open up the floor for any questions specific to what the audience would like. And if there are any questions, I will give them my microphone and you can ask. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> It's a question that, in fact, uh, I was excited when I got it. It links all four of you, the, the industry staffing, future of skills, compu uh, quantum computing, fintech, product design, education. So I'm thinking about student loan. And the, uh, you know all the government topic about like forgiving student loan and uh, trillions of dollars or billions that it's still under calculation actually what will be like exempt or you know just uh, forgiven. Uh, there is one um, new product in student line uh, student loan. It's a revenue based uh, loan. So you go, you take classes or courses that will allow you to have good salaries because it's. What's in demand, you know? Uh, Google, Google skills and uh, Amazon skills and AI and ML and uh, data science, data analytics, fintech at Brandeis, okay? So all these like hot uh, areas that will pay you when you graduate, 
and then the financial institution, which is the fintech, will analyze what a degree you're going to go after, and then they do their risk uh, assessment, and then they will release the money. And once you finish the degree, you can, they, come, they come to you. You employ them, and then they start to get cash flow, and then you analyze the, the data uh, in fact, the risk management is the compu uh, uh, quantum computing so that you can design the product, right? So when I read about that, uh, that product, I was like, how do they uh, estimate that that uh, um, field will stay de in, like demanding? Because, you know, the flock of graduates are coming and then the demand is over, or, or, you know, the, now the, the economy is retracting, you know, so there is that linkage between quantum computing, staffing, fintech, and education, right? So if you want to debate that as product design and, uh, you know, linkage between all these variables to, 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 uh, to launch that product and make it vi viable and also benefit the students out of that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can start because we actually have an income share agreement product, right? So, um, so we're we're doing it from a slightly different angle. Is that we we're, we work with specific schools who we know what their outcomes are. So we know that these students are going to have a really good shot of being employed because the school that they're going to has good outcomes already. So you know that's that's one of the key factors is that we're not offering income share agreements to any school. That, that, that's our company, yeah. Correct. What has already happened. Yep, exactly. But we know that these schools are cutting edge. A lot of them are, um, they could be technical or they could be trades. So we know that these, these skills are still very much in, in demand. So we offer them the income share agreement. And when they graduate, uh, you know, if they're making a certain amount or more, then they start paying us, paying us back. Then we also have the added benefit being, being a workforce development entity where we're working with employers that we're also lining up employers who we know are going to want those graduates so we can help them on, on both ends. So you know, I am a strong advocate of the income share agreement that it is an outcome-based uh, product that you're not paying it back unless and until you are making a minimum income. Uh, you know, I think that's a really important way that we can educate uh, folks and make sure that they're not being tied down with unnecessary debt. Yeah, that's something that my parents told me years ago that if you bet on yourself for education is definitely going to pay off. And I'm sure that we all know that, but we have to find a way to monetize that that makes it sense. And, you know, certain cultures like back in India, that's a given, you know, certain things here, maybe it's not as strongly enforced. Are there any questions from our wonderful audience? Sarah, go ahead. I have just so appreciated the global perspective each of you have brought domestically, but otherwise. I wonder if you might share with us your views on where the next um, place of innovation for fintech might be coming from. I think we think in North America that we're encumbered by a legacy infrastructure that makes innovation um, progression and adoption hard. So I, I look forward to your comments there on, on where we can look for the next generation of innovation. Thank you, Sarah. So. I don't see legacy uh, as an issue because there's a lot of, of companies that provide you with a middleware connecting all the legacy system. But what I do believe will be like um, an avenue that of focus is uh, remittance. So sending money is is a hassle. We're talking both for uh, personal, right? If I want, if I'm in the U.S. and I want to send money anywhere to Central America, South America, it costs a lot of money. Um, a high percentage of, of it, it's it's just ridiculous. And if I'm sending money through banks, uh, I I have all these correspondence and the intermediaries, and sometimes I need to get some information to them. The entire system, the SWIFT system, is is pretty um, pretty obsolete. I mean, there's a lot of change we can do there. And the thing is that what drive this is that the banks are looking. Okay, what is the risk appetite I'm willing to take taking a transaction from a from a specific bank, small, medium, large, and if I'm not interested in that risk, I'll 
work with a bank. So I'll move to, I have to send money to, through, let's say, Deutsche Bank in order to send it. If I'm sending money from Israel to the U.S., I need at least three banks in order to reach the final destination. Now, if we'll rechange the perception, instead of the bank looking at what are the transactions of a certain bank will provide me to look at a specific transaction. So who are the, the beneficiaries that are involved and not which bank is sending me the money? Then we can reduce a lot of the costs uh, of making these, these, uh, um, these um, wires. And I think there's, a, there's room there to, for a lot of companies to gain a lot of income and reduce the friction right now. It takes forever. I mean, we had companies, I had an investment, right? A company received $3 million from a US based, very well known VC. It was held in the bank for almost two months just because of some, um, you know, they needed some uh, approvals and they wanted to know where the money came from. And there's, it's a huge asshole. And there's a lot of room to align it and make it much more simpler. And it's not about the technology. The technology is out there. All you need to do is to understand what do you need to connect together in order to make it work. So that's definitely a realm that I, I think we'll see evolving. And I hope to see something new in the upcoming five years that will, I don't know if it will change Swift, but at least make something easier <laughs> for us. Anybody else on the panel? Can I? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, a very silent revolution is happening in the technology side, and which is going to impact uh, FinTech quite a lot. Um, so some of you who are from quant background, I'm sure you must have heard something called customer segmentation using something like a K-means clustering or hierarchical clustering. All of you have done it, right? So and then basis which there is a theorem called Jacquard matrices, which Amazon used to use to recommend, right? People like you bought this, or Netflix would do the and we used to teach this to our kids. We still do, right? But so honestly, uh, 20% or even not 2% of those recommendations were actually successful in conversion. The conversion rate online was less than 1%. And that was all because of the way this classification used to work, the clustering used to work, right? So very silently, there is a, there is a whole revolution that is going on which is called graph, connected graph. So the whole concept is something like that, that, uh, for example, let's say me, Amitabha, so I do my transactions financially, I have my social transactions, I have my, you know, all those transactions, right? Professional transactions, LinkedIn, social, Facebook, Twitters, and then my financial transactions, right? So the idea of a graph is to create a connected graph and create a profile of, my, of me, avatar, and then try and see avatars across the whole world and create a real a reality check and a real like avatar with the, those characteristics and the advantage of such a scenario is uh, you know it is it is being ex very very much being used in anti money laundering graph based transaction to the accuracy has gone up to search the recommendations have also gone up. So if you see the latest recommendations in Netflix, they are much better than what used to be earlier because they are creating this persona, this whole concept of avatars, basis which they are doing these recommendations. We believe that this technology will take a little more to mature, but once it matures, we would be able to do a profiling of a customer much better and hence do the recommendations which will allow business to prosper. So that's a very silent revolution that's happening. Two years down the line, you'll see the impact. Thank you. Sassy? I think connected to that point is, uh, in fact, we're evaluating using Graph to recommend students uh, which program they should go and study in. Uh, you know, because we see that the point that uh, Maker earlier pointed at, you know, income sharing agreements and outcome based, uh, you know, uh, evaluations. I think any problem, if we're focused on it, that's what leads to innovation around that. Uh, and the, we see that there is so much uh, to improve in the higher education space. We talk about high return programs, but when we talk about high return programs or going to, you know, get placed in Google and, and all of those positives, we should be very mindful and conscious about those programs which don't lead to those outcomes. 
and painfully seeing that this is not leading to those outcomes and so the funds will not come and either the program should change or not exist and that's a reality and a painful reality. So we see the uh, uh, in the higher education space, uh, in, you know, with a fintech lens, I see that there is significant changes that will come which will hold universities more accountable uh, to create those outcomes. And because the money is circling around very cautiously waiting for a system to see if they can uh, get the universities by, by its horns and say that, look, here is the value I'm going to only give you money here. There, you know, banks are waiting to get a, a sense of that. That's what we see right now. They're eager to find ways to address that problem. Uh, and that's a vehicle that, in a way, uh, we are trying to build at grad, right? Uh, so, so that we can enable every single financial institution to get a sense of the outcomes in different programs. Uh, so we are very excited and because of the bias that we are in, I'm saying that that's probably one wave of innovation that will hit us. We have a question back here. Fascinating. Um, I'm Dr. Lynn Rosansky. I'm the vice president of the RAP School. Yeah, really, you hit the button on, for me on this particular one um, because we are very outcomes oriented as Khadija rightly points out. It's really important to us. We really do want to you know, train people. The other side of me, which is the innovative side, says, okay, but if you program universities to be so outcomes driven, you're gonna lose a lot of the creativity and innovation that comes from like the unknown, particularly the liberal arts. You know, as a liberal arts major undergrad, you know, I'm really committed to that, and I think it's really important part of the growth thing. So I worry about the projections that make us too, from an educational institution point, too attached to an algorithm or the outcome. So, like, don't sell us down the river totally. <laughs> yes. In fact, I, I'm a liberal arts uh, student too. I did my engineering, then went on to study uh, liberal arts in my first grad school. Uh, so I completely see the value of it, and that's where I feel uh, there is a lot of philanthropic money uh, that needs to come in alongside the, the banking uh, money and the financial money, which is like a loan. Uh, so while we are looking at short-term outcomes, so the first five years after graduation, uh, that could probably be driven more by the, uh, you know, the, the, the money that is coming from banks, in a way, or innovations like income sharing agreements. We see that there is a good num number of investments that need to happen through the philanthropic money. So in fact, what we are creating is uh, a one package for students. If they go choose a program, if the outcomes are less, but it's you know, socially very responsible program, then there could be a donor who can pitch in, and then there could be a probably an income sharing agreement to participate in it, and the rest of the money can come in as a loan. So we're trying to package that in a way that it suits the requirements and the outcomes of the program. But you're absolutely right. It's a very myopic view to just look at the outcomes. So I talk a lot about fusion, and when I say fusion in education, it's fusion between liberal arts, uh, like science, technical, like finance, my background. Uh, so the best uh, success stories that I saw in the practice is people who can envision intersections of fields. So when uh, an artist uh, comes and joins forces with uh, fintech, magic happens. So I always write about Jack Dorsey and uh, Jay-Z doing the financial literacy programs. And uh, Jack Dorsey, um, he, his board member is Jay-Z, but he also invested in streaming company of uh, music, Jay-Z, right? So we see the marriage of music and uh, and science and tech and they see that in all even if we talk defi and dao and all that when you hear the podcast all the entrepreneurs are either attorney artist liberal arts and they went into fintech and tech and then they learned all what's going on in decentralized life right now digital life and now they're coming out and emerging as technologists but they came from art or literature literature or poetry, really, this this much. So a lot of like fusion of, uh, and coming from the, uh, the, not from the science and technicality, it's more from the culture and the literature and the art. So I'm very big on that intersection. Thank you, Khadija. We have a question back here. Uh, 
Thank you, um, Mary McNiff. I work in fintech in the financial services asset management space, so the fintech before it was fintech uh, field for a very long time. Won't give away my age or years. Um, I'm asking this parent, this question as a parent, actually, and not as someone from the fintech world. But what's very interesting is uh, two tw you know, twin girls heading off to college in a number of years here. I think about the intangible aspects of that ROI on a college investment. And I'd be really curious how that data collection question, because you can look at it from how long, how many years out before I got the job that had that salary that allowed me to contribute back to my loan. But it's what network did this institution provide for me? How long do I stay connected to my university? How many times do I go on for a master's degree? One, two, zero, you know, how do you use that data in your calculations on a potential ROI for a college investment as someone who has to choose for two people at one time? <laughs> so the, we, we are conscious about that. And, and in terms of how we modeled it, we what we did was the, the we established a match score or, or in a way the recommendations pop up for the student not just because of the financial return, but we define it as an overall return. So the overall return, for example, I'm interested in research uh, and, or, or I'm interested in the alumni network. The college that I went to, what I took away is the alumni network, to be honest. Uh, I, I went to Penn. Uh, what really excites me today is that I, the ability to connect with different groups very easily. So it means a lot. If you look at my salary account, you'll not probably be excited, right? So I'm, I'm very conscious about uh, you know, those outcomes. And, and so we actually define this as an overall return for students. But what banks want to look at it, they definitely want to look at the financial return alone. Uh, while there are other players, like you know, some people want to uh, you know, bring in philanthropic money, they would value overall return uh, alongside considering, and they probably will have their own return in the understanding of who do they want to give money as a, as a scholarship, for example. Right? So I think each stakeholder will have their own incentives aligned. And wherever the overlap is, that's where uh, the, the resources would come in. Thank you. Um, oh, please, Amitabh. Uh, I should also say we are close to time. But go ahead, Amitabh, please from uh, professor there about the innovation right the liberal arts and also to you on the so tangible versus intangible very interestingly you need to have some path breakers so if you know there is a place in india called ladakh which is like remains under snow for at least six months and only six months they get sun right that part. so one gentleman one single gentleman do a little bit of a google search on him called sonam wangchuk Sonam Wangchuk, uh, he is an engineer and all that stuff, so he used to teach. He was a professor as well. He decided to do something about that place because it was his native place, right? And he uh, basically, you know, started what we call in uh, India is called ITI, which is absolutely like a very hands-on technical education, like soldiering, like carpentry, blacksmithy, the basic electronics, and gate, nor gates, etc. And then he got up, you know, like uh, uh, local guys, local boys and local girls, took them through a very unstructured, hands-on kind of a job training, right? And then if you look at it, so they have now 30 patents and 300 files to be cleared, right? And those patents are so innovative. For example, uh, using very low-cost material, how to create a, you know, for example, a house which can sustain minus 50 degrees centigrade temperature, and you can remain warm. So they went out and did innovations on, for example, how can you keep the water not frozen in that temperature using very simple like a natural gas and a biogas. How do you do, a, for example, you know, recycling of those wastes, right? How can you reduce the whole carbon footprint? So beautiful amount of innovations which are done. Now why am I raising this point is if you look at it, so these are, again, outcome-driven because each of them has a patent value. And there are companies like, for example, Tesla has gone out and reached out to them for their uh, recycling material, what they want 
they want to use it on their battery because we know Tesla battery are like outdated and they need to think on their feet again on the battery technology. So they're reaching out to Sonab Wangchuk for their you know, waste management on their batteries. So they're ultimately outcome driven, but it was an innovation first. Somebody had to really innovate to trigger that outcome driven, right? Thank you, Amitabh. I just want to say is that in my years on this earth, I've seen the innovation come and go all the time, and it always seems like we are actually becoming more efficient, but we always have the same problems. And uh, I'm not sure what that means, but at the same time, I really appreciate the four panel speakers because you're at the forefront in your own domains, and I'm sure that they're not easy, and whatever that you can c contribute to the global insight, I'm sure is going to help just get to the new equilibrium, whatever that is. So thank you so much. We can have more conversation outside. I know that the speakers after us are just as interesting. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. We have some gifts for you, if you don't mind. Um, I don't think I get one, but it's a... <laughs> And I, I believe that there's a quantum computer in each one of these. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. You. So again, thank you so much. I'd like to thank also the audience. Great questions. And um, I'm sure that the speakers would not mind speaking to you on a one-to-one -one basis. And thank you again. Thank you.